ministries there um, to be able to re help Christians respond to the threat of the cults. Uh, most of my time with CFAR has been helping our newest office, which is in Uganda. So I've had a lot of uh, uh, fun times traveling over to Africa, working with our team over there, training them and teaching them, and they're just a wonderful group of people, and just uh, love being part of this kind of ministry. And the reason why Andrew Womack is on our radar is this guy we have found many places in the world. Paul Carden and I traveled to Thailand and uh, was at an Assemblies of God church that had gone through a church split because of Andrew Womack. And uh, we go to Uganda in Kampala, there is an Andrew Womack um, bookstore in downtown Kampala. Uh, this guy seems to be all over the world, but he kind of has flown under the ra radar of many countercult ministries. Uh, we all know who Kenneth Copeland is. flown under my radar. Yeah. We know who Kenneth Copeland is. We know mm -hmm. who Benny Hinn is. We've heard these names over and over. Um, but Meyer. Andrew Womack is not as familiar as a name. So He's also hard to find on the Internet, I have discovered. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I had never heard of him. And a couple months ago, somebody asked me if one I knew about him, and I had to Google him. And, mm -hmm. it, was, and it wasn't that much about him. Yes, sir. Yeah, the Trinity Broadcasting Network features him. Do they? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, uh, just jump right into it. Oh, when you came in, I, I left some tracks at the end of the table. I wrote this track for our uh, Africa uh, team so they can pass out to people who have questions about Andrew Womack. And also afterwards, we have a few flyers and brochures about our ministry as well as a proclamation magazine, which is uh, geared for Seventh-day Adventists and former Seventh-day Adventists. But Anyway, just a quick overview of Andrew Womack's history. First of all, 1972, he gets married and he begins teaching. I forget where he was living in the beginning. I think it was somewhere in Texas. But 1976, he begins a radio program called, called The Gospel Truth. 1980, he moves to Colorado Springs, Colorado. 1994, started his Karis Bible College. <clears throat> Karis Bible College is found all over the world, 26 locations in the United States and 21 international locations. And so this is where his 20, impact 26 is really in the U.S.? Made. Sorry? 26 in the U.S.? According to his website, yes. Right, and then scattered all over the world. Yeah, 21 international locations. So he wow. is all over the world. Now, Karis Bible College, the purpose of it is not to train Christians to go out and spread the gospel and make converts. The stated purpose of Karis Bible College is to change the body of Christ's perception of God by preparing and sending leaders to proclaim the truth of the gospel throughout America and the world. So the aim of Karis Bible College is to get to Christians and change our perception of who God is. So right there that should make us a little nervous. And that's, well, yeah, that's Job, why we saw the Jehovah's this, Witnesses want to do the same led. thing, and a hundred other false prophets want to do the same thing. Right. And that's why we see the church split when Paul and I were in Thailand. I mean, that's the goal of the Karis Bible College people, is to go into Christian churches and make converts and change them over to Andrew Womack's view of God, which his view of God is basically a word, faith, prosperity, gospel kind of view, which we'll be going through some of this. <clears throat> in 2000, he started his Gospel Truth uh, TV program. March 4, 2001, his son is resurrected. Now, I normally wouldn't throw something up like on an outline like this, but he talks about this all the time. Uh, I have four of his books, three of them, he talks about it. Uh, I watch many of his programs. He talks about this all the time. I believe in miracles. I believe that my son was resurrected from the dead. Now, I, I put together, uh, um, I, I took several, several of his accounts of what happened, and I, I kind of put together what supposedly happened, and it went something like this. <clears throat> According from his viewpoint, uh, Andrew and Jamie went, uh, just got back from an international ministry trip, and they went to bed around midnight. Four hours later, the telephone rang. It was our oldest son, Joshua, he says. 
He said, Dad, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Peter is dead. Dead? What happened? He, he told me. And I declared, the first report is not the last report. That's one thing he says every account. The first report is not the last report. After hanging up the phone, Jamie and I spent some time taking authority and commanding life into our son. Peter was lying on a slab in the hospital morgue with his toe tagged. Peter's skin turned black from being dead for five hours. It took one hour and 15 minutes to drive to the hospital. When they arrived, Joshua met them at the door and said that after the phone call, five to ten minutes later, Peter sat up. Some strange things about this story that he tells over and over and over. <clears throat> I have to ask, why was his skin black? I've got a mortician in my family, and uh, I asked her, why would somebody's skin be black? Because they were dead five hours. She said, there's no reason. Your skin's not going to turn black because you're dead five hours. If you've ever seen a body that's been dead five hours, it, they don't change color like that. I mean, it depends on if something bizarre happened to them, which we don't really know what happened to him, because Andrew never says. Uh, another thing that's kind of curious about this is there's no record of him ever being admitted into the hospital. Which, according to the story, his toe was tagged. He would have been processed yeah, yeah. through that hospital. <laughs> he names the hospital where this guy supposedly was. So it's not like, gosh, well, maybe we just got the wrong hospital. No. He tells us which hospital it was in Colorado Springs. There's no record of this guy being processed through here. How many, how many medical doctors testify to the, this resurrection? <clears throat> how many medical doctors testify to the resurrection? Well, none. And that's... Any, any, any that, coroners, uh, you know. See, Jim, and that's, that's one of the things that uh, Andrew Womack would say is that, well, you know, people would be embarrassed that this guy would have been processed and then so mm -hmm. that he actually wasn't dead, and so they would try to bury the, these records and have them not exist anymore, and that's how they would deal with it. Well, I contacted the ministry so I, to, to find out, well, how did Peter die? What happened? And the response was, well, this, the family sees this as a personal matter and that they don't want to talk about it. Hmm. Okay, if you don't want to talk about this personal matter, my recommendation would be stop talking about this personal matter. <laughs> <laughs> because he mentions it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just really weird. But usually I wouldn't throw it on an outline like this, but since he brings it up all the time, I just wanted to throw this out there, this strange story about his son that is, doesn't make any sense. That's a very serious claim he's making. It is, yeah. 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 I, I, have, I have interaction with a lot of his students because I'm from there. Mm -hmm. And I run into other Christians all the time. And sometimes when I get in these conversations with them, one of the things that comes up is they're, they've come from somewhere else, mm -hmm. another city, somewhere else, to come to this college. Mm -hmm. And what they've done... And one of the reasons they've come here is they're going to go out because they're. I get the impression that they are going to learn at Karis College how to raise people from the dead. Mm -hmm. yeah, people, are wow. being, people are being raised from the dead all over, all over the world because they've been to this college. And that's, that's another concept I've kind of gathered. Mm -hmm. all right? mm -hmm. And another question I have is that comes up occasionally is that they sold everything mm -hmm. to come here. Mm. And, they're, and they're looking for a job because they're broke. Mm -hmm. So they can go to school. Mm -hmm. But they're, yeah. But there's another issue there where I, I don't, I don't, I, I can't get into it with them. Because I, I usually don't have enough time or else they'll shut up after I'm questioning too much. You know? mm -hmm. it's, okay. Surprise. All right. But it's not a it's not a, an aggressive questioning either. It's just like, wow, dude, how's that going on? You know. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let's move on and just for time's sake, if we can hold some comments and questions till the end. Okay. Um, I got started five ten minutes late because the session got started five ten minutes late, and I've got thirty two slides to get through, mm -hmm. and we're on number four. So as I mentioned, he's kind of flown under the radar of many countercult ministries. I went to YouTube and typed in Kenneth Copeland, heretic, and I had 20, 20 hits, 
you see all these um, YouTube videos critical of Kenneth Copeland. After you scroll through about 20 of them, then you start coming to Kenneth Copeland videos that are uh, by Kenneth Copeland Ministries or Victory, the Voice of Victory um, broadcast. Uh, if you do the same thing with Benny Hinn, I can't remember what the number was. It was around 40 to 60 um, hits of people being critical of Benny Hinn. But when you type in Andrew Womack heretic, well, my YouTube video pops up. And as you can see, these two were the same one. It was just on two different YouTube channels. This one here has John Hagee on the front. It says Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. I watched the entire thing, Andrew Womack's not even mentioned in it, so I don't even know why that pops up. Then this other guy has a 26 minute video where he's talking about uh, what's wrong with Andrew Womack. So we have one, two, three videos critiquing Andrew Womack. As soon as you get past that and scroll, all you have are now videos about Andrew Womack from Andrew Womack Ministries. So he is but been able to somehow slip right under the radar of many countercult people, and I think a lot of people need to have information and know who this guy is and what he's teaching, mm -hmm. that we can warn others. <clears throat> so just looking at his doctrine, first of all, under sickness, poverty, and suffering, uh, according to Wamak, he says it's false teaching to claim that God is the one who causes people to die, or that God puts sickness on you to humble you for some redemptive purpose and to perfect you through all the suffering. So first of all, under uh, this we could say God does not cause people to become poor, sick, or die. So if God doesn't cause that, how does that happen? There are three sources of sickness. Uh, from sin, which when he says sin would be a source of sickness, it's not you're sick or whatever because God is punishing you for sin, but maybe of like natural consequences. Like if you're out committing adultery and you um, got HIV, well, it's a natural consequence of your sin. But you're not getting sick because of judgment from God if you have sin. Uh, so natural consequences directly. So from sin and natural consequences, you catch a cold perhaps. Sickness and disease is often demonic. The Krankheit und Gebrechen ist oft dämonisch ursprungs. Depression and poverty and things like that are demonic. So a third place that you might get sick is demonic. Now we shouldn't have a problem with what he just said there, right? Oftentimes when when <laughs> Jesus heals somebody, uh, it'll say that he cast out demons. He healed them. And they're kind of identified as the same thing. So we can agree as Christians, demonic, people get sick from that, people get sick from natural consequences. Um, from sin, well, we can say that, yeah, people might get sick from sin, but it might be because of judgment from God, we don't know. That is a possibility. Yeah, but quick question, would he be tied into healing in the, the atonement teaching? Would he be a he, practice, healing in the atonement uh, teaching? He's prosperity gospel, so yeah, yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Um, but look at the number one. Does God? He says God does not cause people to become poor, sick, or die. Let's look at the biblical response to this. God may cause sickness and death. Exodus 4:11. The Lord said to Moses, "Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord?" So, God may be the source of this. Now, I don't bring this verse up to try to say that God is some kind of cruel, like, you know, argh. there may be reasons behind these things that we don't know, but the Bible is clear that God may be the source of some of these things. James 4.15, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that, implying that it might be the Lord's will that you not even live. Well, the word faith teachers are... I use the term word faith usually, prosperity gospel, same thing. Um, they can't stand the idea that maybe God would want someone to die. Mm -hmm. But according to James here, it may be the Lord's will that somebody may even die. So God may use these things for good. Uh, when um, 
when sickness and suffering come our way. He may use these things for good. For instance, in Psalm 119, verse 67 and verse six, or 71, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. It was good for me to be afflicted, so that I might learn your decrees. God can use these things for good in our lives. Revelation 3.19, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Um, think We should think of God, uh, our relationship with God, the way that uh, a man would have with his son. Um, just because the man loves his son doesn't mean he's going to say, go out and do whatever you want. I'm never going to you know, cause anything bad to come your way. No, if my son keeps disobeying, he's going to be punished. He's going to be disciplined for the purpose of correction, for the purpose of training him. It doesn't mean that I'm evil any more than it means that God is going to be evil for bringing discipline and correction to us in our lives. But still, we've got to admit, we don't always know why God causes or allows these things that may happen in our lives. Uh, people, I, I've, I've uh, sat with work eight people and listened to them talk. They didn't know who I was and what I believed, but I thought it was interesting listening to them. They, they kind of have the idea that for those of us who believe that God may want us to be sick or um, have some kind of illness or poverty, that, that um, it's up to us to figure out why God is causing this sickness and we need to figure that out and learn from that before God is going to take that away. No, sometimes we just don't know. God wants us to be faithful through that, whatever it is. I don't think we fully know why Job went through what, what he went through. We just need to be trusting God still as we go through that. So on the topic of prosperity, Lamech's teaching is that God wants your prosperity. In other words, he... And prosperity within the prosperity gospel and the work faith movement is becoming more of a broad term. Originally, it was, they're just focused on the categories of health and wealth, and now they use it a lot more broadly. It could mean almost anything, being prosperous in anything. Womack usually rests on the subject of health more than he does in anything. He will talk about um, finances and stuff also. I think I have some clips on that, but he is usually talking about health, healing, raising people from the dead, like his own son. You might talk about. And he says, prosperity is actually already yours. You may not realize it, but you are prosperous. God has provided complete prosperity for everybody already. It is yours. When you got born again, you became exactly identical to the Lord Jesus Christ in your spirit. Everything that Jesus is and has, you have in your spirit. You're identical. You have the same power, the same anointing, the same faith, the same joy, the same peace. All of these things are already in you. You don't need to pray and ask God for any of this. If you've been joined unto the Lord, you are one with the Lord. Your spirit has all of the knowledge in it that Jesus has. Amen? Anyone? <laughs> I've got to give him one thing. Out of all the word faith teachers I have ever researched, he uses the most unique verses out of any of them. The way he justifies that bizarre thing that you just heard him say is by using a verse, 1 John 4.17. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say so are we going to be in the future world. So are we going to be in heaven. We sing these songs about when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. In the sweet by and by, but nobody likes the rough now and now. <laughs> but you know what? This scripture says as He is, so are we in this world. Anybody think that's what that verse really means? <laughs> so as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Well, you, you can make that mean whatever you want if you take it out of context. Mm -hmm. So we have holes in our hands as well, because as He is, so are we in this world. 
Yeah, well, that's why I got the ache in the side. You know, it was that spear. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, I mean, it's, a, it's the same thing. Well, let's just go back in context and look at this. First John 4, starting with 16. And we have known and believed uh, the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, the key thing that Andrew's drawing on is this line down here. As he is, so are we in this world. Well, in context, what is as he is? What, 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 he's referring to God. As God is, so are we in this world. Well, what is God like? What, what does it say in context? God is love. As he is, as God is love, that is what we are to be manifesting in this world. If you look in context, he's using the word love over and over and over. It's four times in these two verses. The next verse talks about love three, another three times. Mm -hmm. John is talking about love here. He's not saying that every way that God is, or Jesus is, you have this exact same thing. The context is stripped so far from its context. I've seen Mormons have such a clearer idea of what context is than some people in the word faith movement. That's scary. Hmm. So what's the Bible teaching about prosperity? I would say that God is interested in our prosperity. And let me um, qualify that, though. When we say prosperity, even the prosperity teachers will define it differently at times. Sometimes they will define it as vast amounts of wealth are waiting for you that you can call into existence. Other times they will say just meeting your basic needs is what prosperity is. I, I would say that God is interested in meeting our needs, definitely. I have no problem saying that. But there's more to the story to be said than that. We won't fully receive complete prosperity in this lifetime, especially if you're going to define prosperity as healing. I believe that God heals, 100% God heals in this lifetime. Um, I had a very significant problem with my knee that was healed. I've seen other, I know of other people, instances where people have been healed. And I'm sure we can go around the room and people can talk about things that they know of where God has healed. We believe that God heals. But a complete, full healing is not going to be in this lifetime. It's going to be in the future. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, um, I really like the way the New American Standard puts it. Um, Paul describes what things are like in this lifetime. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Hmm. Now, folks, on the last part of this, our inner man is being renewed day by day. What does that mean? Spiritual growth, mm -hmm. right? The word faith movement says that there's this spiritual law out there that as you grow in your spirit, you will grow in prosperity. Health and wealth and all these things will, will grow as you grow spiritually. They usually re refer to verses like uh, 3 John 2, where he says, Beloved, I pray that in all things that you prosper and, and uh, be in good health, even as your soul prospers. And they say it's spiritual law, but that's opposite of what Paul is saying here. He says, even, e even though your inner man grows, e uh, is being renewed, as you're growing spiritually, what happens? First part of the mm -hmm. verse... Though your outer man is decaying. Hmm. Who here can identify with that part of the verse? <laughs> okay. For the microphone, everybody either shook their head yes or raised their hand. <laughs> uh, I'm in my 50s now, and I cannot believe the rate of decay already. I can't imagine what things are going to be like in my 60s. <laughs> and yet, I'm growing spiritually. This is the normal course of action in this lifetime. Um, God is interested in healing, and he does heal at times, but the natural course of life is that it goes down. Now, did you know that the death rate is today is exactly the same as it was 200 years ago? 100%. One per person. 100%. Yep, one per person. We all decay and we all die. Um, but there is going to be a time when we get our resurrection bodies that are no longer under subject of decay and 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about that. We will get new bodies that will not decay, will not waste away, and that will be eternal and live forever. Number three, our sanctification trumps our prosperity in this lifetime. That's one thing that we need to trust God with. If God doesn't heal us, or if God doesn't help us find that job, or whatever, um, maybe there is something that God is using to teach us, to humble us, to help us draw us closer to His image. We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so though I would say God is interested in our prosperity, God is more interested in your holiness. Mm. God doesn't want you to be happy, He wants you to be holy. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that once, when we become holy, we do become happy in the right direction. Because we're finding joy in the Lord. So, that's how I see this fitting together in the Bible in response to Mr. Womack's view. Prayer and faith for Andrew Womack. First of all, with prayer, do not ask God for things. You're not supposed to ask God. Because that's, that's a lack of faith. As I've, as I've said already, God has already given you everything. You have everything. And just as Jesus is, and so are we in this world. And Jesus has everything. We have everything. It's already supplied to us, but in a spiritual way. So you don't ask for God, you know, please give me this, or please heal me from that. That's a lack of faith. Instead, you already have all things given to you by God. That probably the majority of you ask God, Oh God, please pour out your love in my life. Oh God, give me more faith. Oh God, touch me and heal my body. Do you know all of those are wrong prayers? The truth is, God has already done everything. In your spirit, your spirit is perfect and complete. And instead of spending the rest of your life asking God for these things, it should be you releasing, discovering what you already have in your spirit and releasing it. Hmm. Well, under prayer, we don't ask God for things. They still call it prayer, but prayer is not asking God for things. It's that, as it's pejoratively called, name it and claim it, you... You name what you want, you believe it, and you say it. So, that's prayer. What about faith? Faith compromises, there's two aspects in order to have faith. First of all, you believe something. You have to believe something is true in your heart. Whether your physical senses can sense something is true or not, you have to believe it. If you believe the Bible says that you're completely healthy, you have to believe that no matter what happens. My sister just uh, fell and broke her arm about a week ago, and she just had surgery, and they had to put this bar in her arm and put 11 mm -hmm. screws in it mm -hmm. to hold it together. If she was word faith, the whole time her goal would have been to try to maintain the belief that she's healthy, that her arm is not broken. You have to believe that God has healed you from this. Mm -hmm. You have to believe that you receive right now and then you shall in the future have them. That future might be only a minute. It might be ten minutes. It might be a day. It might be a week. But you have to believe that you receive now and then you shall, future tense, see it. So you believe now that you're healed completely. Now if you just go by what your senses tell you, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So if my sister would have gone by what the x-ray said, she goes by how bad it hurts when she moves her arm. She says she keeps having these dreams that she's playing badminton. They're a badminton family. She keeps having these dreams that she's playing badminton and she's reaching out for it and she like wake up screaming in her sleep because her arm jerks and all this stuff. If you go by your physical senses, that's where you're going to get yourself into trouble because your physical senses are going to lie to you until you're, you're not healed. Mm -hmm. You need to go with what Scripture teaches, that you are healed. So to be spiritually minded is to be thinking according to the Word. If you are thinking according to the Word, all that produces is life and peace. If you are thinking according to your five senses and going only by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, then you are going to die. You will die physically, you will die in your emotions, you'll die in your finances because you're only going to go by the physical, natural things. 
So that's the first part of faith. To have faith, you need to believe that something is true, and then you need to speak out that. If it just remains in your heart as belief, it's not going to do anything. You need to speak that out. So it really comes down to that it has to be the combination of saying it and believing with your heart. Sometimes this is called uh, power of words, the force of faith, positive confession. Confession, and it's the idea that your words can create yeah. reality. Yeah. If you believe in your heart and you speak it out, you can create your own reality. This is how God created the heavens and the earth. It's how He created us. It's how He created plants. It's how He created animals. He spoke everything into existence. And since words are the parent force, everything that is created by words will respond to words. You can see Jesus talking to a fig tree, and the fig tree responded to him, died immediately when he told it to die. He spoke to the wind. He spoke to the seas and said, Peace, be still. And all of these things responded. Did you know physical, natural things will respond to words? Hmm. So this is why you don't ask God for these things. He's already supplied it to you. And he's given you the power then to create these things. So uh, if you're poor, well, then you need to start speaking money into your checkbook. But I can tell you, if you could start speaking and prophesying and saying, bills you are paid, finances you are coming in, and if you would start speaking your faith, things will obey you. Physical, natural things will obey you. Mm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Not a charismatic crowd at all, are you? Okay. That sounds blasphemous. <laughs> it's Seriously, terrible. it does. It yeah. is terrible. Yeah. So let's look at the, the Bible's teaching on uh, prayer and faith. So Andrew Womack tried to tell us that uh, in with prayer you don't ask God for things. Does the Bible tell us that we're to ask God for things? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ask, seek, not. Yes. <laughs> you are told to ask God for things. One of my favorite verses mm. on the subject is Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Amen. You ask God things. For, God for things. I think of the Lord's Prayer. You know, give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say, and thank you for already having given us this day our daily bread spiritually. We can't command it. <laughs> <laughs> already ours. And also, according to the Bible, uh, from the Greeks' perspective, faith and belief are the same thing. Uh, in our language, they do seem different. And we often characterize them different. I've seen preachers do this often. And it's like, you know, belief is on one level and faith is this bigger, mm -hmm. stronger, more powerful thing. Mm -hmm. In the Greek, actually, it's the same word, but just a different function. One's a noun, mm -hmm. one's a verb. I kind of wish, though, when they translated the Bible, they used the same word. Because you can say belief or believe. Mm -hmm. One's a verb, one's a noun. But some, for some reason, when they translated the Bible, they used two different words to express it. Uh, in Greek, it's pistis or pistuo. Uh, pistis is faith or trust, which is a noun. Pistuo is to believe, to entrust, have confidence. It's the same thing. So they're trying to make this strange distinction. You know, you've got to have faith, which faith means you believe. Well, no, faith is belief. It's the same thing. I was teaching this once, and there was some word faith people uh, in the... Um, in the room listening, and they said, why are you making such a big deal out of this? So actually, I don't think I am making the big deal out of it. They're making the big deal out of it. I'm showing them that they're wrong. You cannot make a case from the Bible that faith and belief are two different things. And we have a, one verse here that shows them both in one verse. Even the righteousness of God through faith, pistis, in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, pistuo, it's Romans 3.22. It's the same thing. So, prayer and faith, according to the Bible. Sovereignty versus authority. Now, this is where things start to really go downhill. Womack's teaching, well, first of all, when he's talking about sovereignty, he's not talking about like Calvinism versus Arminianism. Okay, 
the most staunch Calvinist and the most staunch Armenian would probably stand next together and throw up when they hear what he's talking about when he's talking about sovereignty. Totally different thing. He says that sovereignty, um, under about sovereignty, the common Christian belief is, he says, it's slander against God to suggest that God is sovereign. And listen, instead of me telling you what he believes, listen to yourself. But I think that the worst thing that has happened, the worst slander against God is the teaching on the sovereignty of God. Oh. Religion has come up with a whole new definition of sovereign that you can't find in a dictionary. It's only a religious connotation that goes along with it. And religion has said sovereign means God controls everything. That He's responsible for everything that happens to you. And I believe that that is the worst heresy in the body of Christ. It is absolutely untrue. And that has slandered God. I was watching a television program of a preacher and he actually interviewed a woman who this woman and her daughter were abducted at gunpoint, taken out into a field. They were brutally raped and then the man made them both lay face down and shot both of them in the back of the head. The daughter died, the mother survived and came through it. She had problems but she was still alive and she was on this television program talking about, well, God works all things together for good. We know that God had a purpose. And she blamed God for rape and murder, saying that this was God that controlled it. I'm telling you, that is a lie. That is a heresy. God does not do that. God does not control everything that happens. Being gang raped and my daughter shot in the head and killed and me shot and living. That was actually God's blessing. That's a deception and a lie of the devil. That's not a blessing. It's the devil coming to steal, kill, and to destroy. Some people just can't handle this stuff. You're saying it's my fault? Absolutely. I'm just I'm just, that's how, so I'm saying. He is totally twisting. I, I didn't see this program that he's talking about. I have no idea what program that was, but I cannot imagine that that woman was saying that it was a blessing that her daughter was shot and killed and that she was raped and shot. It is totally misrepresenting what the common evangelical would understand by making the statements that he said she made that um, God still has a plan and God is still in control. Um, God is still someone that we can trust, even though this, these evil kind of things happen. <clears throat> I would rather be in a world where there still is a God in control, even in the face of situations like this, instead of believing that this world is out of control and God can't do anything to help us. We are stuck in this world and, and God is helpless to watch us go through this. And he wants to help and he can't do anything. And that's what Andrew Womack believes. So instead of sovereignty, his view of God is God is totally inept, unable to help us. Though he wants it, he doesn't want us to be hurt. He can't stop us from anything. Instead of sovereignty, humans have this thing called authority. Uh, when God created this world, he gave authority to Adam. When God said, you have dominion, the earth is yours, you rule it, you subdue it, God gave mankind authority over this earth. God created man to be a God over this earth. Not a capital G, not divinity, but in the sense of absolute ruler, absolutely in control. So the idea of giving mankind dominion according to Womack, and this is, this is just classic word faith doctrine. He's, he's not coming up with anything new here. But classic word faith doctrine, God gives dominion to human beings, meaning that now they're completely in control of this world. He gave that over, it's like, giving, like writing on, signing the pink slip and giving it to your, your son. Now it's they're his car, it's completely his car, he can do whatever he wants with it. Well, there was a problem that came along, and uh, Adam turned this authority over to somebody else. Adam gave all the authority over to Satan when he sinned. Mankind is the one who released Satan into this earth, 
And God would have been unjust as a spirit. John chapter 4 verse 24 says God is a spirit. And he would have been unjust as a spirit to come down here and take back this authority and power that he had given us because it would have violated what he said. God never intended for us to turn it over to the devil, but when we did, he upheld our authority to do that. And mm -hmm. this is how Satan became the god of this world. But lucky he didn't mm. stay there. Mm. So Adam gives the authority over to Satan. Now Satan has complete authority and control over this world. God didn't want it to stay this way where we didn't have any authority. And that's why Jesus came so he could purchase the authority back for us. So Jesus took authority back by dying on the cross. God had to become a man because now he had authority in this earth because of his physical body. He gave physical human beings authority. People that have a physical body and God is a spirit. So God had to become a man. No man could fix this problem because they were part of the problem. And finally, he took our sins upon himself, died for our sins, and when he rose from the dead, he completely stripped Satan of all of his power and authority. So Jesus purchases the authority back. And now it's given to Christians when we become born again. We have the authority. Uh, so originally, humans had it. They gave it to Satan. Like you sign the pink slip over, you mm -hmm. give it to your son. He takes the pink slip, hands it off to his buddy. So as a father, you send somebody over there to get it back and give it back to your son. Now we have the authority back. But one important thing to notice, well, we see that humans can have authority now. Who does not have authority? God does not have authority. The truth is, Satan is only using the power and the authority that God gave mankind. And he can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. Hmm. Okay, I forgot that one was going to come up or I would have led into it better. So Satan no longer has authority. Because that was purchased away from him. God still does not have authority either. Because he purchased the authority back and gave it back to human beings. There is no conflict directly between God and the devil. But Satan is still fighting us. And we have to take this God-given authority and use it to resist the devil. And if we don't do it, God is not going to do it for us. You could say God can't do it. Because he has given us this authority, told us to resist the devil, and he'll flee from us. And he's not going to violate his word. He's not going to change just because you're in a desperate situation. You have to learn your authority, and you have to start using it. Many people don't understand this, and they, they are in a crisis situation. Maybe they're dying of cancer. They've got some incurable disease, and they're pitiful, and they're praying, and they're saying, Oh God, please heal me. And they're begging... God, and they're wondering, God, why haven't you healed me? I know you can do it. They don't doubt that God can heal. And they're praying and they desire it and they need it. And they just can't understand why it's not working for them. And yet, every person that comes up to them says, how are you doing? Oh, I'm dying. I'm going to die. The doctor says, unless I get a miracle, I'm dead. You speak forth your doubt and unbelief and you just can't understand why you aren't being healed. It's because God upholds the universe by the integrity of His Word. And if He was to violate His own commands, where He told you to speak to your mountain and not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say comes to pass and you will have it, death and life are in the power of the tongue. If He was to violate His own instruction, the universe would blow up. He, it's His integrity. It's His truth. And He cannot just violate his instructions and come down. And even though you're, you're violating everything, you're speaking forth your unbelief instead of your faith, you're just speaking forth your doubt and fear, you're, you're going against everything he told you to do, but because he's God, he comes down and says, Oh, King's X, time's out, suspend all the laws, forget what I said, forget the promises, forget all of my instructions in my word, and I'm just going to heal you as a unique situation. That's not how it works. You're hung by your tongue. And it's the integrity of God that holds everything together and He cannot violate His Word. 
you in a sense tie the hands of God. Mm. He mm. told you to do certain things and you're doing exactly opposite to it and wonder why he's not coming through. He has these little catchphrases he likes to use and you just heard one of them, you're hung by your tongue. <laughs> he says that a lot and it just cracks me. You're hung by your tongue with that little accent of his. <laughs> so uh, God is in incapable of helping you because he has given you authority. There's nothing he can do for you. Um, he's, there's nothing he could done, have done for that woman and her daughter when they were drug off and raped and shot in the head. Hmm. He was incapable because he had set it up this way where we hang ourselves by our tongue. Uh, we have to speak forth the words that create our health and security and prosperity and all this other stuff in our lives. Biblical reaction to this. Dominion does not imply power in words. Do I need to come up with any verses to show this? Um, to, you can't connect the two. It just the, It's just totally foreign to the Bible. It is just ridiculous. Human dominion does not imply that God cannot act in this world. Can anybody think of any time God does anything in the Bible without getting permission from people <laughs> using their words? Um, I have a video clip of uh, Benny Hinn is uh, interviewing Miles Monroe, who's a word, word faith teacher from, uh, uh, from Africa. And the way Miles Monroe put it is that we give God permission with our words to act in this world. And that's how we use our authority. You know, we, God has the power, we give him the permission. He wants to work, but we have to give him permission to work in the word, world with our words. I mean, but can we think of God doing anything in this world that he does without our permission? I mean, like flooding it? <laughs> Stuff like that? I don't think he asked Pharaoh permission to do things to him. He, uh, sorry? I don't think he asked Pharaoh permission to do all those the plagues. plagues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, but... <laughs> the way the word faith movement, though it will, will try to explain stuff like that, is that God put it upon Moses to tell, to speak forth those words, oh, oh, oh. and then is able to cause it. So when you, when you we look for examples to where the word faith movement um, fails this test of what they're trying to say, we need to make sure that we find ones where a prophet doesn't say something. Um, so many of them, so many of these word faith teachers I've seen, they love using the example of Sarah from uh, the Bible with Abraham. God changed her name from Sarai to Sarah. To, so when she would speak her name now, um, it meant something different and she was able to conceive. That's why she was able to conceive is because her name was changed and spoke forth her children. They, I think one of their analogies breaks down with Jonah, for example. You know, um, God wanted him to go to Nineveh, and he decided, I'm not going. <laughs> That's and a good one. And the Lord intervened, and he ended up yeah. in Nineveh. Yeah. Here, here's another good one that we already even looked at. Exodus 4.11, The Lord said to Moses, Who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now think about when this was, this is Old Testament. Who had authority in the Old Testament? Satan? So humans didn't have authority. And that's even where it breaks down with the plagues. Moses didn't have authority. They might try to explain it that way, but, well, wait a minute. Who had the authority then? Satan did. Satan had authority here, according to the Word Faith Movement, yet God is the one who makes people deaf or mute, gives them sight, makes them blind. It's God. God has authority. God has sovereignty in the sense that he is in control in this world. Wow, we actually got through all that even <laughs> on time. So are there any questions or any points that others, I know some of you have some interesting things to say. Yes, well, back. I just have a couple things I wrote down. He says we're not supposed to ask for anything in prayer, but instead, and then we're supposed to give God permission, but instead we're telling, if, we're, if we believe his way, we're actually telling God what we want. And then the other thing is just, I don't mean to pick on him, but his deadpan face is just so spooky. Anybody else would be having 
you know, their emotions would come out. When they talk about the women that were raped and everything, he's just like deadpan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, he's always got the same expression on yeah. his face. And I, I have friends who, I don't know if they know about this guy, but they, they do the positive speaking. It's just terrible. Yeah. Um, it was interesting that earlier, um, well, I, I gave the talk on Joyce Myers yesterday, which is word, she's word faith. Oh, yeah. And so we went through a very similar kind of outline. Um, and you've seen the woman in the wheelchair chair here. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, she she was asking me about the word faith movement, and she was telling me that this this uh, uh, girl was telling her that she could be healed. That she's in a wheelchair because she has polio, and she told me that this this girl that told her that she could be healed obviously had a pretty bad cold. She was she was sneezing and blowing her nose mm -hmm. and all this, and you know you can be healed and. How are you telling me that I could be healed from polio when you can't even be healed from your, you know, get rid of your cold? Oh no, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, you, you can't admit if you're in faith, you can't admit that you're sick. Because once you say that, oh yes, I'm sick, your words are now causing that sickness to be further rooted in you. You've got to speak forth belief, not doubt. But I've noticed though through through history of many the word faith teachers, as liberals do, they cannot follow their own ideology. What happens when they get cancer? They go to the doctor. They don't speak the cancer away. Mm -hmm. See, they can't follow their own... Oh, and if they really believe their ideology about getting wealthy by giving money to God, then why are they still wealthy? Why don't they give their money to God? None of them ever do. Well, well, right, will Andrew because... Womack give money to Benny Hinn? <laughs> he give all his money to Benny in? I bet you won't. No, no. Yeah, they, they don't need to tithe, but see, they give you the opportunity for you to sow your seed faith money in their ministry, and then God will bless that, and then they will use that to grow their ministry, which is, is all over the world. But, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. So, sometimes, as I, I've seen some video clips, I've really regretted that I didn't download them and save them. Frederick Price, does anybody know him? He's, oh, he's yeah. a definite, definite huge word faith uh, guy from a long time ago. On, on his website at one point, he was saying that uh, uh, they were trying to raise money so they, could, uh, they needed to get all new cameras so they can go high definition. So when everybody was going to high def cameras and they needed to raise all this money, would you please send in money to help us do all this? I'm thinking, why don't you just speak it? Speak for <laughs> the words in the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Don't you I have mean, any if faith? If anybody could do this, wouldn't you think one of the leading components of this movement could speak? And I'm just, I think myself, I didn't download that video. And of, that course you'll never see, and of course, you'll never see them in hospitals healing people or morgues raising no. people from the dead. You'll never see that. No, no, no. They don't go there and do that. Um, but uh, one answer that I've heard about that is uh, that will point out that uh, when Jesus went to the was it the pool of Siloam where he just healed one person, not everybody. So Jesus didn't heal everybody that he went around to. But anybody that came to him for healing, he always did if they had faith. So. Yeah. Do you, oh, go ahead, you're first. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the college. Um, did you research what they obviously they teach things that are um, in conformity to what Andrew Romack is also teaching? But what are they preparing people to do? Be clones of him? Or um, that's no, I have not researched their their college. I assume that they're learning all the stuff that we just heard here. It's probably just a money maker for his ministry. It might be. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's some of these locations are in places where people are really poor, and I can't imagine, like uh, in, in Uganda, where we've been, that Karis Bible College is making a lot of money. Yeah. Although they have hundreds and hundreds of students go through there, we, we've seen um, video footage of him visiting Karis Bible College out there, and the amount of students that he had was just unbelievable. But I can't imagine that these people could pay very much compared yeah. to in other locations. Well, he, he's expanded his compound up in up in the mountains. 
Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, he yeah. took up a, a took over a whole serious property there. Right. Yeah, yeah. serious. Yeah. Very developed. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like I was saying earlier, I think he's on the radio all over the country, and I'll pick him up on the radio out away from Colorado, and. It seems like I've hit I've hit the same the same messages a lot out here, and I'm and I'm wondering when these guys show up, I run into them downtown or you know at the Seven Eleven or Cracker Barrel, whatever, you know, and they're telling me they're going to Karis, but they're from Pennsylvania, and one's from New Zealand, one was from Missouri, all over the country, they're coming in here, and I get into their history a little bit, you know, how'd you you because know, we're Christians, praise the Lord. And 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 they're and they're they're telling me that they've sold everything mm -hmm. to come here, mm -hmm. yeah. and they're looking for a job so they can they can be here. Mm -hmm. You know. So wait, how does that work? Well, I'm speculating that the message they're getting out there on the radio is sell all your stuff, and I'll teach you how to raise the dead. Mm -hmm. Because raising the dead is a constant thing that comes up in the conversation with these guys. Mm. Guy from New Zealand, the guy from Missouri, the kid from Pennsylvania, uh, a couple others. It, that raising them from the dead is mm. a thing. And another message that I I happened to be got sick, was in a motel for a month, and I flipped on the video, and here's Andrew, and he's bragging about how he also raised another dude from the dead. His wife called him. And he went, and the, the dead guy's wife called him, come over and see Ernie or whatever his name was. He was laying there in his Barco lounger, dead. And Andrew spoke words over him, and he come back to life. And they knew he was dead because they'd already called the EMTs, and the sheriff showed up, and or the sheriff was there when he got there. EMTs were, yeah, that's right. EMT, sheriff was there. He was dead when he walked, when Andrew walked in the house. He spoke words over him, and he come back to life. Now, I never followed up on it. I probably should have. I know some people in the sheriff's department, you know, hey, can you check out this? But it was way back. Mm -hmm. You know, it was way back. It was probably sometime around the time Peter got resurrected at the hospital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, why, why we aren't, you know, getting into this. And I'm... I'm tempted to go up there and try to enroll or something, you know, because <laughs> try, I, what? try to enroll in Paris. Oh, enroll, yeah. yeah. And, you yeah. know, see what's up. Find out what the tuition is. Yeah, right. <laughs> and tell them I got a whole bunch of acreage over in Michigan or something. <laughs> hey, should I sell my ranch? <laughs> yeah, come on over. We'll teach you how to raise the dead. But, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Kid from New Zealand. Yeah. It's yeah. a last question, and then we yeah. have a plenary session. The, the sover yeah, the sovereignty of God matter. I think there's such clear biblical evidence of God's sovereignty. You would think of Joseph and what he went through, Pharaoh, and how he defied God, and God ultimately uh, fulfilled his will with that kind of opposition, despite all the things that Pharaoh spoke. Um, yeah, I just, the, the, the occultic side of some of this teaching. I think that's a major area of, mm. of theological concern. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, when, when they talk about the power of words, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's the same thing that the New Age talks about witchcraft. Um, witchcraft, yeah. um, which is shocking to some people that you would identify. Well, the, it's, it's witchcraft. Well, what, what, the way witchcraft or Wicca views it is that you're manipulating the spiritual world mm -hmm. using. Um, incantations or by the using physical of, ob yeah, objects the power of in this words. world yeah. or with the power of your mouth. Mm -hmm. well, that's the same thing that they're saying. Yeah. They just put yeah, Bible and Christian, Christian terms on it. Yeah, uh, And ideas like this go like wildfire in places like uh, Africa where Paul and I go because of uh, um, syncretism. The, the people already mm. have this animistic ideas mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Wicca type of ideas about power of mm -hmm. words and manipulating spiritual reality. And yeah. here comes these uh, yeah. Christians and their old voices saying that, you know, yeah, you can be like this if you mm -hmm. use the power of your words and all this. And this is what we believed all along. We just didn't put the... When I was in the walk, I heard similar stories like that. People that had been involved with the occult seeing, oh, the Bible has this. The word, you know, really, they, they talked in very similar ways like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let's close in a word of prayer. One more thing. Something else he teaches is that God is not sovereign, and He God cannot do anything without us. Mm -hmm. And whatever's going on, He can't He can't do it without us. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's blasphemy. Yeah, yeah, it's it blasphemy. It is. It's, it's, yeah. it's the worst part of the word faith movement, and I think a lot of times that's the part that a lot of people don't realize about the yeah. word faith movement. Um, yeah, I, I have an 11-week series on the word faith movement on my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and uh, I get pretty heavy into it, a lot of quotes from um, Frederick Price and others about this, this inept God that can't do anything in this world without us. And so uh, check that out if you really want to dig into the word faith. But let's close in prayer. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you, you are sovereign. We thank you that this world is not just one big fate that we're kind of just flowing through in history, but you hold history in your hand, mm. and you guide, and you nurture, and you take care. Um, but you discipline as well. And... Things aren't always wonderful. Things aren't always pleasant. We pray that you would help us grow in our true faith towards you to where we can trust you in all these situations and praise you and worship you and find joy for you in all these situations, no matter what's going on in our life. We thank you that you're in control. We pray that you would strengthen us in our witness and our understanding of truth, that we can reach people that have been lost in uh, these, these false religious systems mm. that distort who you are, that they can understand and worship you who you truly are in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.